Good morning, ARC. How are all three of us doing in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless all of y'all that are on the stream this morning, making your way to church, you Good know, morning. or making your way out the bed either way. Um, we are excited to have all of you with us this morning. Um, if you are here in the building, if you'd please stand, we're going to start with our first song, Friend of God. Who am, I? Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? And is it true? And is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend, yeah. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Sing, I am a friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Let's go back to the verse. Who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. And is it true, yeah? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Sing, I am a friend, yeah. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. God Almighty. Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Sing God Almighty. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Let's sing it again. God Almighty. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Because I am a friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Sing, I am a friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me. Friend. Let's do it one more time. I am a friend. I am a friend. Sing, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Amen, amen. Well, good morning, beloved. Uh, just turn to somebody and say hello. We still in a little pandemic wearing masks. Say hello to everybody this morning. <laughs> Amen. And uh, feel free to have a seat if you like. 
I want to welcome everybody this morning. I am Pastor T, one of the four pastors here at Anacostia River Church. Um, Anacostia River Church exists to glorify God by making disciples from the four corners of the block to the four corners of the globe. And uh, you have come, and that's what we're about this morning, making disciples and encouraging the saints in the work of the Lord. Uh, just a few announcements um, for those of you who are uh, members of the church family or those of who you in the area uh, and would want to join us in these things, you'll find them printed in your bulletins. Uh, Lord willing, tomorrow morning, we'll go out for Coffee and Convo. That's our weekly outing in the community, uh, sharing the gospel, praying with our neighbors and friends. Uh, we'll meet uh, at church office at 8.30, I think, tomorrow morning. Is that right, 8.15. Ashley? 8.15 tomorrow morning, and then go out uh, to Good Hope Road and that area sharing the good news. So uh, pray for that time. If you cannot come, pray that the Lord would go out with us. Uh, pray that he'd make his word effective as we share the gospel. Pray that people would be converted. Uh, we come to faith, saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's tomorrow morning, 815. Then just to remind you a couple of ways that you can serve the body uh, here at the church. Uh, you'll see them all printed again in your bulletins there. Um, the children's ministry is still recruiting uh, servants for that ministry to help us teach the gospel and the scripture to our little people. We're hoping to uh, kick off children's ministry again uh, late spring, summer, sometime in the next few months. Uh, but we need many hands to make this work light. So um, do indeed sign up for that. Contact our sister Maura Ballard or our sister Abby uh, Robinson for more details. Also, um, we continue to need volunteers for the hospitality ministry. Uh, that's a ministry that helps us to welcome our visitors and to uh, feed our bellies a little bit uh, after the service. So if you're interested in snacks and coffee and drinks, or you if you're interested in the food truck ministry, um, hello, somebody, uh, <laughs> interested in the food truck ministry, you might want to join the hospitality team. Uh, you can contact our sister Precious right out uh, for more information about that. Uh, and then finally, uh, we give God praise for um, those saints who lead us in worship Sunday to Sunday. Um, and they are still, yeah, amen. Amen. Michael appreciates y'all. Michael, Michael appreciates y'all. <laughs> uh, and so if you're interested in uh, playing an instrument or singing with the praise team, you can talk to our sister Essie or Taco or Eva for more details. Amen. So those are, uh, no, one more announcement. Uh, on page 13. Exciting opportunity for us to get to know each other better. You, you'll recall that in some ways our theme for the church this year is relaunching the church, uh, coming out of the pandemic, learning again to be together as a church. Um, and one way to do that is around our tables. And I want to thank our brother uh, John Cawley and others who have put together this idea um, for us to table fellowship, to get to know each other around the table. Um, doesn't take much, just takes a willingness to have somebody over to your place. You don't have to have a big palace. You know, maybe you say, hey, I can invite two people over or maybe you can invite 20, whatever fits your situation. Uh, so all it takes is a willingness to have somebody over. You don't have to be a gourmet chef. A spaghetti dinner is just as good as a five star dinner. Right. Amen. And so the, the main point is the fellowship there. Uh, so you'll see the details on page 13. If you're interested to do that, reach out to our brother John uh, and others who are helping to coordinate that. Um, and let's begin to. Uh, rebuild something that maybe we took for granted before the pandemic, uh, and that is table fellowship, the ability to sit together, fellowship together, uh, eat together, and uh, encourage each other in the Lord. Amen? Amen? All right, well, those are our announcements, but uh, we also have a number of things to uh, celebrate today and to give God praise for. Um, first up is we got a couple birthdays today. We've got some birthday twins uh, who are away this morning celebrating their birthday today. That's our brother Mubuso Zamchia uh, and our brother Pastor Dennis Washington. Um, yeah. They're the dopest brothers in the church. Reach out to them, give them encouragements, let them know that you're praying for them and thinking of them on their birthday. Uh, and not only do we have a birthday today, but we also this week had a birth to celebrate. Uh, yeah, we give God praise for Stacy and Matt Swanson and the birth of little Simon, uh, who came in at, I think, nine pounds, two ounces. Ooh, uh, yeah, a little linebacker and a scholar, you know, and so pray for mama and baby and uh, all that good stuff and uh, send them your love and, and uh, remember them in this time. And then also um, this past weekend, we've had some college graduates. Um, and so we give God for the college graduates. Uh, they, yeah, amen. 
they just like college students. They ain't here to get your applause yet. So uh, they come in later before the sermon or the pastoral yeah, prayer. Sure. We'll remember them again. Say again. Already? Yeah. No, it's a little early, isn't it? I don't know. I do. Anyway, so here's what you'll learn about ARC. We're casual, right? So people start correcting you all up from the choir stand, and wow. it's all good. It's all good. We're family. We're family like that. We don't take ourselves seriously. We do take the gospel seriously. Seriously. So our college graduates are spiritually minded. They may be off at the Alpha Project with campus outreach, doing spiritual things. And so they ain't worry about your hand claps. Um, <laughs> they will take your cash gifts, though. Uh, so do remember the college students to encourage them and uh, to bless them as well. And, of course, uh, it is Mother's Day. And we give God praise for mothers. Amen. Amen. Just a couple of weeks ago, as we've been working through our sermon series, we were talking about being a community that, that rejoices with those who rejoice uh, and weeps with those who weeps, uh, weeps, who weep. Uh, and, and Mother's Day is one of those occasions uh, where we rejoice with those who rejoice, those who have had children and are raising children and caring for children, things of that sort, those who have their mothers still and uh, are able to celebrate in person with their mothers. But we also weep. We weep with those who have lost their moms, um, whether it's in the last year or the last few decades, um, or those who are estranged from their moms, uh, or those who want to be moms, um, but haven't yet had that blessing. Um, and so it's a time for us to, yes, give thanks and to rejoice, but also remember the brother or sister next to us uh, who might be mourning uh, in this time as well. And in the pastoral prayer, uh, later in the service, we want to do exactly that. We want to rejoice together and weep together um, as we think about the gift of mothers. Amen? All right. Well, uh, one other thing we want to celebrate is any folks who are visiting with us this morning for the first time. So uh, we don't like to embarrass our visitors, but we do like to greet them uh, and welcome them. So if you're visiting with us for the first time this morning, we invite you just to stand where you are. We want to give God uh, praise and thanks for you this morning. <laughs> Man. We're so honored to have you guys with us. Make yourselves right at home. Um, do what you would do at home. Uh, and um, we hope to be able to stick around afterwards to get to know you a little bit uh, face-to-face as well. Amen? Okay. Well, those are our announcements for, for this morning. I want to invite us to take now a, a moment of silence just to prepare our hearts to uh, continue in the presence of the Lord and in his worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from a psalm written by David. It's a prayer. It's a prayer uh, in which he goes from crying from, for justice to considering his own death. But this is what he said about his own death, what he anticipated on the other side of death. This is also our hope. This is also something that applies to us. Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. In other words, David was anticipating the day of his own resurrection. The life after this life, when he would awake, as it were, from the sleep of death in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, he anticipated seeing God's face and the very act of seeing God's face flooding his soul with satisfaction. That's what awaits us, beloved. Satisfaction in the face of God. And that's why we worship now. That's why we praise him now, looking forward to that day of satisfaction. So I invite you to stand together as praise team, Sister Esther, begin to, to lead us. I invite you to stand as we lift up our voices in praise to God. Amen. Amen. 
So I see some little saints in the building. We all know that I have hand movements for days sometimes. And this is one of them Sundays. We have a lot of hand movements today. Um, so we're going to be singing two songs that we're going to have hand movements to. I will enter his gates, or he has made me glad, as some people might say. And I know what's glad. Who knows these songs? Raise your hand if you know these songs. Raise them high, like you're proud of it. Amen. Okay. So um, what I want to do is I will enter his gates. We just going to, everybody just start, we're going to enter in. We're going to enter in. Everybody was going to be walking. Yep. Let's do it together. We're just all going to do it together. This is a working exercise, right? With Thanksgiving in my heart right here. And then we're going to keep entering. We're going to enter because you got to go into the inner, you know, the inner courts. <laughs> enter his gate. We're praise right here. Amen. Amen. I will say this is the day. We're going to point this day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Then we're going to point to him because he has made me glad, right? He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Then we point to him again. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. So also we know that today is not only Mother's Day, but it's also Communion Sunday, right? Everyone had their little piece of communion. All right, little saints, when we take communion, it is a reminder that the Lord has given us because his death on the cross was a gift. So if you don't know what the cross is, I want to encourage you after we sing all these different songs, you're like, mom, dad, mom, Miss Essie was talking about the blood and mumbling words and trees and all these different things. Ask your parents what that means. We need to teach our little ones what that means, our little saints what that means, all right? So I know it was the blood. We're going to point, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. I know it was the blood for me, all right? So when we say one day when I was lost, this is how it's going to go, and then die on the cross. So then when we say he's never said a mumbling word, it's going to be like this. Nailed him to a tree right there, laid him in a tomb, right? And then he rose up from the grave, hallelujah. And then we're going to go back to, I know it was the blood. I know that was a lot of movements, but we all going to do it together. We're going to follow one another and we're going to help our little saints as we do this. So we're going to start with, I will enter his gates. Ready? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me All right, so we're going to point to him. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has I will enter his gates. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me. All right, so let's point to him. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has All right, I will enter his gates one more time. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. All right, he has made me glad. We'll point to him. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for him. And then I know what the blood. Ready? I know it was blood. I know it was blood. I know it was blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. I know it was the blood for He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. He never said a mumbling word for me. They nailed him to a tree. They nailed him to a tree. They nailed him to a tree. They nailed him to a tree for me. One day. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. 
They nailed him to a tree for me. They laid him in a tomb. They laid him in a tomb. They laid him in a tomb. They laid him in a tomb for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. They laid him in a tomb for me. They rose him in a grave. He rose up from the grave. He rose up from the grave. He rose up from the grave for me. One day. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. He rose up from the grave for me. And I know what the blood. And I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Give yourself a clap. Come on, hand movement. Good job. Who's grateful for the cross? Jokes aside, the Lord has been good. This is a day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it because he not just died, but he rose so that we might have new life, right? And because of that, we want to praise him. We don't want the rocks to cry out for us. We don't want anything else to cry, but we want to worship. So we're going to sing the song, Soul Align. Christian's going to lead that for us this morning. If you don't know the words, let this song minister to you. But please sing along with us this morning. Do you know it? Because you still know just a little bit. The God of creation. You're there at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every barren star of strangle fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. So will I. So light. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You God, you God of your promise. You don't speak in vain, no syllable empty your voice. For once you have spoken. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Oh, and as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Evolving in, evolving in pursuit of what you say. If it all reveals, if it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every pain in the sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. So 
To worship so light. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. Oh. You chased out my heart through all of my failures and pride. On a hill you created, light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you, so will I I can see your heart in everything you've done Every part designed in a work of our call love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you die to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We lift high your name. There's no one like you, maker of heaven and earth. Everything in creation worships you, is meant to worship you, God. So we say, Lord, even as we prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare our ears to hear the word, God, would everything in us subject ourselves to your word, that we would have eyes to see what you're saying in your word and ears to hear. God, I ask that you would bless the preaching of your word this morning, that we would submit to it, that we would obey your word, so that at the end of the day, Lord, you would see all praise and glory and adoration that you are due in and through our lives. 
God, again, we say that we are thankful for the cross and we're thankful for your resurrection, that we get to have new life in you. Thank you for the grace for today. Thank you for your new mercies for today. Thank you for your loving kindness for today. We are grateful, Lord. We are grateful, Lord. We bless your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. To clap and give God praise as you sit. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, praise team, for leading us so wonderfully this morning. The singing of God's praises. I think I get just as much out of the motions uh, that go with the songs as I do the songs. So thank you for that. And once again, happy graduation to the graduates. Yeah, amen. Amen. Let me get the graduate. I see one graduate. I don't know if there's some over in the overflow room or not, but let me get uh, Brother Jalen to stand real quick. You want to stand? Amen. Amen. And 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 I love I love no stay standing, brother. Stay standing, brother. I, I love Jalen. He since he's the only one in the room this morning, I get to sort of dote on him a little bit. Lo, love Jalen. One of the reasons I love there lots of reasons I love Jalen. Um, one is I, I love Jalen because he loves his family. Uh, I don't know how often we've had conversations just about his family. Uh, he wrote a bit of a family history once and shared it with us, an article in the school newspaper. And uh, I think you might have one or two family members with you this, this morning. Is that right? Yeah, you want to introduce some of them or all of them? That's your sister? Your mom? Your mom? All right. Happy Mother's Day. Excellent. Amen. Let's see. Amen. 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 We're so glad and honored you guys would be with us. We're so proud, of, as I know you are, uh, of Jalen and all the graduates and excited about the next chapter for him. I don't know how many of you all know, uh, but our brother's planning to go off to Dallas Theological Seminary and, um, yeah, do some graduate studies down there. He wants to teach one day, if I remember that correctly. Is that right? Amen. Amen. So be sure to encourage uh, Jalen. As I said, he, he welcomes cash gifts uh, and, and any, other, any other gifts and encouragement to give you. Congratulations, brother. Congratulations. Amen. And again, happy Mother's Day. Uh, happy Mother's Day. And as I said earlier, uh, this is a day both of rejoicing and weeping, of, of gladness and sorrow. Uh, and so I just want to offer a prayer this morning for us as we are uh, either celebrating with our moms, we still have our moms, or we are missing our moms, we've lost our mothers, uh, or perhaps are estranged from our mothers. Um, and to offer a prayer for us this morning, if we are attempting to become mothers, and that's, that's been difficult. We have miscarried, or if we are still waiting on marriage or any number of things, um, that can make this day hard. And so I want to pray for us and ask the Lord to comfort us and encourage us as we both rejoice and weep. Right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what we have just been singing. If the rocks, the mountains, the wind, the universe will worship you, so will we. We thank you that you have made us to worship and given us a unique tool for worship, hearts that sing and mouths that speak. We pray that, Lord, everything we say and everything we do, indeed, everything we feel would be acceptable in your sight. That it would be an act of worship, that you would be exalted that, Lord Jesus, you would be set apart in our hearts as Lord, ruler of our lives. And we thank you for your many good gifts which you have given us. Maybe one of the best gifts ever is mothers. We thank you, Lord, for our mothers. We thank you for such a thing as mothers. None of us would have life without mothers. And so we give you praise, Lord, for our moms. And, and we pray together for each other this morning, whether we are rejoicing at at life and motherhood, or whether we are in some way weeping this morning for the loss of moms or the inability to become moms. Lord, you, you, you love us in it all, and we pray, show us your love. Come near to us. Come close to us in love. Comfort those who need to be comforted and fill with gladness those who are rejoicing. And as we thought about a couple of weeks ago, make us a covenant community that is able to do both things to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And Lord, there is 
perhaps no pain, like a, a mom lost. And there is perhaps no gladness, like a birth given. And so wherever we find ourselves this morning between those two experiences, Lord, would you by your spirit meet us right there, come near to us, help us, strengthen and encourage us. And let the one who weeps find grace to rejoice with those who rejoice. And let the one who rejoices find grace to weep with those who weep. That we might be again a community of empathy and mutual care, giving each to the other what they need, O oh Lord. So be with us this Mother's Day and be with us this graduation weekend and be with us in, in all of our celebration and all of our mourning. Be with us as our God, our King, the one who loves our souls and gave his Son for us. Be with us by your Spirit and in your word we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, beloved, this morning we are continuing in our series in our church covenant. Uh, you will find the covenant printed in your bulletins on page nine. Later on in the service, when we have a Lord's Supper, we will renew our covenant together as a, as a church family. But this morning we come to the, I think, the ninth section of this covenant. that begins with, we will defend and maintain an evangelical ministry. And what we have done in, these, in this series is basically unpack each of these paragraphs uh, as we are sort of relaunching as a church, as we are coming back to meeting in person as a church. Uh, we thought it important to go back to our basic documents and to go back to basic teaching about what it means to be a church and what commitments we have made together uh, as a church community. Now, as a little bit of historical context, you'll forgive me if I start to sort of I'll do a little history geek stuff up here, but as a little bit of historical context, the year was 1054 AD, 1054 AD. That's when what is called the Great Schism happened. Schism is another word for split. The Great Split happened. It's the first split in church history. Uh, the church split between East and West, between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And when they split, they both excommunicated the other. The Eastern Orthodox Church looked at the Roman Catholic Church, said, no, you guys are not the true church. You, you've kind of left um, the, the true path. And the Roman Catholic Church looked at the Eastern Orthodox Church and said, no, we're the true church, and you guys have missed the mark. That was the first great split. 500 years later, the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, would split again in what's called the Protestant Reformation. It's called Protestant because those Christians who left the Roman Catholic Church were protesting. They were protesting the abuses that they saw in the Roman Catholic Church and protesting um, the, the error that they saw in the Roman Catholic Church, particularly when it came to uh, the, the gospel. The Roman Catholic Church, again, said, you guys are going off into error. And they said, no, 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 no. You guys need to be reformed. That's where the word reformation comes from. You need to be reformed. You need to change your teaching and your practice according to the word of God. And just like with the Great Schism in 1054, the question of who's the true church kind of came to the front. It seems that any time church is split, that's the question that comes up. Who's right? Who's correct? Who's true? And that's an important question, beloved. I mean, in Christianity, we are talking about ultimate things. We're talking about life and death, eternal life, salvation, forgiveness, hell and judgment, heaven and God. You got to get those things right. It's important to ask that question, who's right, and to arrive at the truth in these matters. Now, the Eastern Orthodox Church said, we're right because we basically um, believe the seven ecumenical creeds, seven statements of faith that were agreed upon by the church across church history, and we haven't departed from that. Rome, you departed from that. And the Roman Catholic Church said, no, 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 we're right because we got the Pope. See, the Pope in Rome is the Bishop of Bishops, right? And, and he speaks with authority, uh, and the councils since those others also have authority. And the Protestants said, no, 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 we're not appealing to creeds or councils or popes. We appeal to the Bible. That the Bible is our authority, and that the true church gets its teaching, its understanding, its emphases from the Bible. Our church is a Protestant church. 
We descend from those churches in the Reformation, so it's no surprise that our church covenant includes a section that defines a true church's ministry. And this is the section that we've come to this morning. And so I want to read it there for you. Again, it's on page nine. It's the fourth paragraph from the bottom. And it says this, we will defend and maintain an evangelical ministry in this church by supporting and upholding three things. The preaching of the word of God, the administration of the gospel sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, the exercise of church discipline. Now, in a nutshell, in this section, what we are promising to do as members of this church is to be and to defend a true church. To be a church as the Bible describes a church, to emphasize and to maintain the ministries that the Bible makes a priority of uh, in the scriptures, in the New Testament in particular. And what I want to do this morning is explain some of the terms and the ideas here, um, because this is maybe a paragraph in our church covenant that has some words and some ideas that are either maybe a little confusing or concerning, um, and some ideas that, that maybe even trouble us a little bit. So I want to talk about these things that, that might be unfamiliar with some of us uh, and help us to understand what's here. I want to do that, if you're taking notes, this is my outline. I want to do that by answering two questions. Number one, what kind of ministry is Anacostia River Church? What kind of ministry is ARC? And number two, answer this question, how do we defend and maintain the ministry at ARC? How do we defend and maintain the ministry at ARC? And may the Lord give us wisdom and light and understanding as we think about his word together. Amen? So let's take that first question. What kind of ministry is Anacostia River Church? Well, the basic covenant promise here, the basic responsibility of the membership here is found in that little phrase, defend and maintain an evangelical ministry in this church. Now, you know what to defend is? To, to defend means to protect, right? It is to guard something. It means we will, we will resist anything that attacks it, right? And to maintain simply means to keep going, right? To see that something continues, something remains alive. And when we promise to maintain the ministry of this church, we're promising to keep the ministry going as well as to defend it. Now, specifically, we promise to defend and maintain an evangelical ministry in this place. And that's where we might begin to get into some confusion nowadays, right? The word evangelical uh, is a word that needs to be clarified in our current political and social and cultural context, okay? So I don't want any confusion here. Notice that evangelical is not capitalized, small e, evangelical. So the statement is not, it's not referring to the movement called evangelicalism, capital E, evangelicalism. We are not promising to maintain a movement that wasn't in existence 1,500 years ago, that wasn't in existence 600 years ago, right? So that's not what this is about. We are not committing to defending some social, political sort of tribe and group that you hear so much about in the news, right? No, this word is small e, evangelical. It comes from a Greek word used in the Bible called euangelion, which means good news. Euangelion is the word from which we get the English word gospel, right? So what we are promising to defend and maintain here, again, it's not all that political, social, subcultural stuff. We're promising to defend and maintain a gospel ministry here. Now, it's interesting. During the Protestant Reformation, the first people to use the word evangelical were Roman Catholics. They were using it as an insult of Protestants, right? You gospel people, right? And the Protestants were like, oh, that's dope. We'll hold on to that. <laughs> that's, that's who we are. We, we are gospel people. So again, that's what we're promising to be as we covenant together is to be gospel people, to have a gospel community and to defend and maintain a gospel community to guard it against attack, and to make sure it grows and goes on. So now, as a word of application, I want to encourage you not to think of ARC as an evangelical sense, as an evangelical church in the capital E sense, as an evangelical church in that sort of political, cultural kind of way that's causing so much confusion. And please do me a favor. Don't, don't think of me as an evangelical pastor in that sense. My theology is evangelical, which means four things. I believe the Bible is the word of God. 
I believe that Jesus was crucified for our sins, buried, and resurrected. I believe that you must be born again. You must repent of your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that we are, as Christians, called to be activists in the world. That's what evangelical has been historically, right? In that sense, I'm an evangelical. Please don't call me that. This is way too much confusion out there about what this is. And so we are not an evangelical church in that subculture sense. We are theologically, uh, and we don't want to be confused with things. We want to, cl- And the reason we don't want to be confused with those things is because those things so often are not about the gospel. But we are a gospel people, right? I'm a gospel minister. We are a gospel ministry. So we're not evangelicals. We're not fundamentalists. We're not any of those kinds of things. We're trying to be, and the pastors here are trying to lead, a gospel community. So, if people ask you what kind of ministry we are or what kind of church we are, tell them we are gospel church. Tell them we are a gospel ministry. We are gospel people. We are Bible people. We could not care less. Well, let me not say we. Let me just go and be personal. I could not care less about defending evangelicalism but I do take the gospel seriously. We will defend the gospel and advance the gospel and try to make the gospel plain with all that the Lord gives us in the way of grace and strength. Amen? So this is what we're asking you to defend and maintain. And if you're a member of this church, we want that to be self-conscious business for you. We want that to be intentional business for you, that part of what it means to be a part of this family is that we're going we're gonna to lock arms. We're going to knuckle up in a, in a metaphorical sense, because some of y'all knuckle up for real. We're going to knuckle up in a metaphorical sense and defend the gospel and maintain the gospel. So that, that brings us into our second question. How do we do that? How do we defend and maintain our ministry at ARC? Well, I think it's right there in the statement of faith. The short answer is by supporting and upholding, by supporting and upholding the ministry. Now, the statement of faith goes on and tells us in a sort of longer way, those three bullet points, there are three specific ways that we are going to support and uphold the ministry of the gospel here at ARC. And the first one you see right there is to preach the word. We're going to preach the word of God. When the reformers thought about preaching the word of God, they they thought most specifically about the gospel itself. They were not sort of talking about preaching everything that's in the Bible, though they certainly did that. But when they thought about the preaching of the word of God, what was really at stake was being clear about how someone is saved, being clear about the the truths of the gospel that, that, that lead to salvation. And they thought that the best way to protect the gospel, the best way to protect the Bible was to unleash it to preach it, to let it out of its cage. Don't don't bottle it up. Don't don't chain it. Don't hide it. Don't don't try to get cute with it. Just let it out. Let the gospel, let the word speak because God speaks in this book. And God's power, the power of the gospel to, to save people from hell, to save people from judgment, and to save them to God and for eternal life. The power of God is in the gospel, Romans 1, 16 and 17, right? I said, let it out. Preach it. And so we defend and maintain the gospel and the word of God by spreading the gospel and the word of God. The gospel draws its strength and its life from its spread. For the reformers now and for Protestants and for us as a church, the the correct preaching of the gospel was the the highest priority in Christian ministry. And, And they weren't making it up. They were getting that right out of the Bible. So look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I should have told you we're going to bounce around the Bible a little bit here. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, verses 1 to 5, these well-known words from the Apostle Paul. The Bible says there, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And then he starts to tell them what the gospel is in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance. You see that phrase there? As of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the 12. And Paul goes on to talk about more appearances after the resurrection. You see what Paul's saying there. You see what the apostles are saying there. The very the thing of, of, of the most importance, the very first importance in Christian ministry is the gospel, that, that we get it right. And in verses 1 and 2, I want to suggest to you that, that Paul actually gives us um, some instruction there about how it is we uphold and support it. Did you see that? Notice what he says um, in verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. Now, he's going to say, he's going to give us about four phrases here, and these are four phrases that we could use to sort of apply this notion of upholding and supporting. So I preach the gospel to you, number one, which you receive. So we uphold and support the gospel by receiving it, by, by believing it, right? By, by giving ourselves over to it. So this news that Jesus has died for our sins, been buried and raised from the grave for our salvation and our justification, that's news. It's not like the news in the newspaper. You fold it up and when you're done with it, you recycle it. You throw it away. No, that's news that is meant to be grabbed onto by faith and held onto to be received as treasure, to be entrusted to for our salvation. He says, you received it. Now, here's the second thing he says, in which you stand. Not only do you receive it, but now you stand on it, right? You're basing your life on it. You're marking out where you stand in life based on this message. This is what it means to be gospel people. We stand on the gospel that Christ has died for us and rose for us and salvation is his name and no other name on, on the earth. And all of life now becomes for us a, a reflection of this basic glorious truth. Our marriages become a reflection of the gospel. Our singleness becomes a reflection of the gospel. The way we speak becomes a reflection of the gospel. We stand right here. And then notice the third thing that Paul gives us in terms of supporting and upholding, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. So we're going to support and uphold the gospel. We're going to remember that this is how we are being saved. And we're going to hold fast to this truth. It's not the kind of thing you receive once and then lay down. It's the kind of thing that you hold on to, that you preach to yourself over and over again, that you come to the Lord's church to hear preach to you. It's the kind of thing that you share with a friend when they're struggling, suffering, and hurting. It's the kind of thing you remind a friend about when they're succeeding and maybe getting a little proud. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing you just keep coming back to as a touchstone and holding fast to because this is our life. This is our eternal life. And apart from it, we are lost. We are dead in sin. And we're destined for judgment. So this is how we support and uphold the gospel preaching ministry of this church. Receive the preaching of the word of God. Believe the preaching of the word of God. Take your stand as a community, as an individual, on the word of God. Hold it firm, not loosely, because it is the word of God. It is the gospel. Now, if you're new to the Bible and maybe new to Christianity, or maybe you grew up in a Christian home, but it was grandmom's faith and mom's faith, and you just kind of was born in church, and you, it never really clicked for you what the gospel is. Let me, let me just sort of share it with you real quickly uh, from, from verse 3, where Paul says there, I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. Now he's going to give us the facts of the gospel. Number one, fact number one, Christ died for our sins. That's fact number one. He took our place. He suffered and died on the cross for what we did wrong, not for what he did wrong. That God is striking his son, and he is suffering in our place, the judgment we deserve because of our sin. Right? That's fact number one. He died for you. Fact number two, notice, that he was buried. His death was real. He was actually buried and for three days lay in a grave. This is actual historical 
events. This is not something made up. This is not something pie in the sky. This is things that people have been eyewitnesses to. This is actual history. And the reason that this is important is death is our most powerful enemy. All of us one day will die if Jesus doesn't come soon. We're all mortal. That means we, we die. And yet Jesus has tasted death for us in our place. He not only took our sins to the cross, but he tasted our death in the grave. But he didn't stay dead. Here's the third and glorious fact. And without this fact, Christianity is a sham. Without this fact, we are the greatest fools on earth, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Without this fact, this is, it's a wrap. All of us are lost. But he was raised on the third day. Notice, in accordance with the scripture, that comes in there twice. God said he was going to do this centuries before. And here Jesus is in time and history doing exactly what God said he would do, dying for us, being buried, and being raised from the grave so that he would conquer death and give to us eternal life. We could live with him without sin and without fear of judgment because he had already taken God's judgment for us. It is very good news. We are good news people. We are gospel people. And beloved, if if this is new to you, let me tell you what God requires of you, that you confess your sins and turn away from them, and you put your faith, your trust in Jesus to save you from God's judgment and to give you eternal life and to serve him as your Lord, as your God, as your ruler. And the promise is all of your sins would be wiped away. The righteousness of Jesus would be given to you. You will be adopted as God's own child and live forever in his kingdom, in his glory, full of joy forevermore. If you're here this morning and you've not put your faith in Jesus and confessed your sins, I want to encourage you to do that even right now. Call upon the name of the Lord. Say, Lord, I am a sinner. I have done my own thing, gone my own way. I have rebelled against you. I have done things I knew were wrong that I never even knew were in the Bible. But, but my conscience told me we're wrong, and I did them anyway, and I'm guilty before you. Would you forgive me? Not just because I'm asking you, but because Jesus has died for me. He has suffered your judgment for me, for my sins. And he's been raised from the grave. And, and Lord, give me faith to follow him as my Savior. Do that this morning. Do that trusting in Jesus. And you will be saved. You will be saved. Now, this is the gospel we commit ourselves to, that we stand firm in, and we reject any other so-called gospel. So Galatians chapter 1, if you want to look there with me real quick. Galatians chapter 1, Paul is writing now to another church in a region called Galatia. And he writes there, he starts with the gospel because they were turning away from the gospel. Remember what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, we're meant to stand firm in it. Here's a church that's not doing that. And so he writes to them beginning in verse six. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. This is part of what it looks like to stand firm in the gospel, is to reject all the other false gospels. Hold to the one that the apostles preached that we have written for us in the scripture. And to pronounce a judgment even, an anathema, on those who preach a different gospel. And so, ARC, together, it's your responsibility, it's our responsibility, to make sure the gospel is always preached from this pulpit. Right? And not as something tacked on, but as the main thing. Right? We must not allow other things, even other good biblical things, to, to sort of surpass the gospel and take that first importance position. We care about justice, for example, but the gospel is of first importance. We care about marriage and and singleness and purity, but the gospel is of first importance, right? 
we, we care about authority and, and government leaders and, and, and truth. But the truth of the gospel is of first importance. And we want to make sure that that's always true of this pulpit. As members of this church, you have a sacred responsibility to ensure that this is always a gospel preaching community. You must either fire a false preacher or you must rise up and walk out together. Start a church next week somewhere else. It doesn't matter if the pastor was the founding pastor. It, it, it doesn't matter if the preacher is an eloquent preacher. It doesn't matter if the preacher, Paul says here in Galatians, is even an angel. They bring a gospel other than this gospel that you have heard. Let them be accursed. That's how serious we are about this here. So we are a gospel community. And we are shaped by this gospel. We are committed to it. And the, the commitment to support and uphold the preaching of the word of God is how we defend it. Right? We preach it. That's its own defense. And we support it by receiving it, believing it, standing in it, and protecting it. You with me so far? Any questions, comments, concerns? Amen. All right. Well, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. <laughs> <laughs> the second way we uphold and support the gospel ministry is we administer the sacraments. We administer the sacraments. You see that there, that second bullet point uh, underneath there, the administration of the gospel sacraments, and then it clarifies baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, sacraments are fancy words, a $10 word um, that usually Protestants, lots of Protestants don't use. It's, it's usually associated with high church traditions like high church Anglicanism and things of that sort. Um, we, we prefer as Baptists, you know, we brown paper bag kind of folk, right? So, so we, 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 we prefer ordinary words like ordinance or law or command, right? That's basically what we're getting at. A sacrament is something that Jesus commanded uh, to be observed by the church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that by the First of all, they teach that there are seven sacraments, um, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, sick, marriage, and holy orders, right? So they, they've got a whole sacramental system that they conceive of as going from birth to death, right, uh, covering different stages of life. But if an ordinance is something Jesus commanded, then we want to test that by the scripture, right? Now, what Roman Catholics teach is by the very act of some of these sacraments, like baptism and the Lord's Supper, by the very act of doing it, the grace of God is given to the one who's participating. Right? It's almost mechanical. The, the phrase is ex opere operato. Again, just geeking out a little bit, right? By the operation of the thing itself. Grace is given. Now, this is one of the things that the reformers were like, no, that needs to be reformed because that ain't in the Bible. It's not in the Bible that just by participating in um, baptism and participating by, in, the, in the Lord's Supper that, you know, just by the act of those things, you know, God's grace is given to a person. That's not how his grace is shown. That's not how we enter into the covenant. The, the Protestant reformers are like, you no, know, first of all, there are only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So Jesus commands baptism in Matthew 28. In the Great Commission, verses 19 and 20, where he tells his disciples to go into all the world and to make disciples, baptizing them, right, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that he commanded. So when he made that command, baptism meant to be observed by the church until Jesus comes again. It is the sign that we have entered into Christ's lordship, that we have been baptized into his death and raised again with him in eternal life by faith, right? And so this is what the reformers taught. Now, this makes sense, right? Because, again, these are the things that Jesus commanded. In Matthew 26, he commands the Lord's Supper, which we'll do in a moment. He says, as, as often as you will, do this in remembrance of me. Right? So those are two commandments that he gave the church to be observed until he comes again. And they are meant to be pictures of the gospel, which is why this, this, this point of getting them clear is important. So baptism is a picture of the gospel because, again, it, it pictures us dying with Jesus and being buried in a watery grave, a symbolic grave, and being raised with Jesus to new life, as Romans 6 teaches, through faith. And the Lord's Supper is a picture of the gospel. You remember what Jesus says in, in Matthew 26 when he gathers his disciples there for that final supper before he's crucified. He takes the bread, which had been uh, used for centuries in the Passover, and he says, this is my body broken for you. 
and he takes the cup of wine, and he blesses the cup of wine. He says, this is my what? Blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins, right? And so he takes that old Passover meal and reinterprets it in terms of his own life and his own death and resurrection to save us from our sins. So they, they picture the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is for the ear, the sacraments of the gospel are for the eye. God has given a people who, at that time, were largely illiterate, pictures to see the gospel, right? And so we want to be clear about what they mean. We want to be clear that they don't save you. They picture a grace that we can only receive by faith in Jesus Christ. And be very clear, it is faith in Jesus that saves, not religious ritual. Even religious ritual that's established by Jesus himself in the gospel. Apart from faith, it is impossible to please God, the Bible says. And so what's most, most critical is that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to think more about this theologically, you can go on to our SoundCloud uh, account. Uh, when we first began a church, we did a series through our statement of faith called We Believe. And um, we get to that point in the statement of faith where we got sermons there on the Lord, Lord's Supper and baptism. So you want to think more about the theology of it, et cetera, you can go and listen there. But let me move us to some practical sort of points and application here in terms of our practice. At ARC, we practice, of course, both baptism and the Lord's Supper. And again, we believe that when those things are done in faith, they communicate God's grace to us in salvation. They picture our salvation through faith in Christ. But we also believe that there's a logical order to the ordinances, right? That, that getting the order right also helps us keep the gospel clear, right? So once a person repents of sin and believes on Christ, their first act of Christian obedience is to be baptized, just as Jesus commanded in Matthew chapter 28. Now, once a person publicly professes faith in Jesus through baptism, they are brought into the membership of the church, right? So baptism is the doorway into church membership, which is God's household. Now, what do you do every day with the members of your household? At least once a day, maybe two or three times a day. You eat, don't you? You eat. Now, now some of y'all might be at the TV, some at the table or whatever, but, but somewhere along the line, you go in there and you say, mama, what you cook, right? Uh, and, and a few a few husbands in here cook, so you come home and say, baby, what you cook, you know. And that's good, but you, you sit and you eat together, right? This is what we do in God's household. When we, in a, in a moment, come to the Lord's table, we are all of his adopted children through faith in Christ, sitting at his table, eating together, right? And by that act of eating and remembering the death of our Lord and the resurrection of our Lord, again, God's grace is communicated to us in, in, through our senses. Right? Through touch, taste, feel, sight. Right? And so we, we feed together in that way. But th there's an order. There's the preaching of the gospel. There's the hearing of the gospel in faith and repentance. And then there is baptism. And then there is membership in the church. And then there's the privilege of membership, which is to eat together at the supper. To eat together at the supper. Now, if you mess that order up, you begin to mess up the gospel. Right? And this is where we, we would differ from other legitimate, godly Christian churches that preach the same gospel, but practice this a little bit differently, right? Um, so let me give you three examples of, of, if you mess this order up, how it begins to mess with the gospel, right? Number one is something called landmarkism. Landmarkism. These were churches that a century or so ago um, began to teach that the only baptism that was valid was the baptism that their church performed. So if you came to their church at some point, having been baptized somewhere else, they were like, no, 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 that don't count you got to be baptized right here. And in doing that, they were not recognizing the broader body of Christ, right? That Jesus has more churches than just that local church, right? And so landmarkers then begin to mistake the extent of the gospel, that the gospel goes beyond their little walls and their little community, and it goes to churches in every nation, tribe, and language all over the world, right? So we don't want to make that mistake. Here's another mistake. There's some teachers that have some churches that have taught baptismal regeneration. Fancy phrase that means that you are born again by being baptized. That's false. 
That's not in the Bible. You can see how that distorts the gospel because that, that shifts the attention away from repentance and faith and says, again, you need to do this act. You, you're not really saved unless you're baptized, right? That's, that's a distortion of the gospel. Or think, for example, about, uh, and we love them, our pedo baptist friends, our, our, our friends who practice infant baptism, uh, our, our Methodist friends, Anglican friends, our Presbyterian friends. We believe the same gospel, right? So no shade. We believe the same gospel. We differ on baptism. They believe that the children of believing parents are proper subjects of baptism because those parents are claiming a promise that they see in the scripture that their children will believe. Now, all you got to do is sort of say, let's watch this rascal grow up. Right? Vipers and diapers, man. <laughs> you know, the sin nature begins to flower, right? And, and, and at some point, they actually need to be converted. Now, now, these folks believe that too. Their child needs to be converted, but they are putting baptism in front of the conversion. And here's what happens in that person's life. I've seen this many times as a pastor. In the 20 years I've been a pastor, folks who come to our church say, we'd really love to join your church. Do we have to be baptized again? I said, well, why you ask that question? Well, you know, I grew up in a, say, Anglican, Pres- you know, Presbyterian church or something, and I was baptized in the infant. And I go, baptized? You weren't really baptized because you didn't have faith, right? And they say, one of the things they stumble over is, well, if I get baptized now, what does that say about my parents? And I say, you're asking the wrong question. Because baptism was never about your mom and daddy. It was about your personal discipleship to the Lord. And if your baptism makes you look back to something your parents did rather than look back to what Jesus did for you, it is not actually communicating grace to you as much as it's communicating family loyalty to you. And family loyalty has its place, but it ain't in front of the gospel. It ain't in front of Jesus. It ain't in front of your ability to look back to that day when you were baptized and celebrate again what Jesus has done in your life. That's what the ordinance is supposed to do, right? And so we have folks who come here who may come from pedo baptist backgrounds, and we say to them, actually, that's not a proper baptism. You should have heard the gospel, repented and believed the gospel, and then you became a proper subject of baptism, okay? So getting this order right is important. So if you bump into someone who might feel a little way because they wanted to join the church, but, you know, they tell you, they won't let me join the church because, I, you know, I, 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 they won't take my baptism. It's like, well, slow down. Slow down. That ain't true. You can join the church. But we want to do everything according to the word of God. And what we see in the word of God most clearly is people giving a profession of faith and then being baptized. Okay? And we just want to follow the order of the book there. Okay? So that's part of how we support and uphold the ordinance here. Let me give you a couple other sort of um, easy sort of applications here. Number one, you support and uphold the ordinances by coming to the ordinances. When we have the table, the supper, make that a priority, right? Come that Sunday. If, you, if you're thinking about weeks where you're going to visit with a friend at their church and hang out a little bit, that's a fine thing to do. Don't do that on communion Sunday. Come here. Let's reflect the fact that we're one body and let's remember together what Christ has done for us. Do the same thing with, um, with baptisms. We have baptisms usually in our members' meetings. Uh, folks will, can, will give a, a statement of their testimony. We'll take them to the water. Come to the members' meeting. Celebrate with them their baptism and remember your own baptism. These are times for us to be refreshed in the work of the Lord uh, in the church body, both in the other people's lives and in, ours, in our lives, all right? So number one, just make, make these things a priority. These are commands from Jesus that we do them until he comes, don't neglect these acts of obedience and worship, right? Make them a priority, okay? Num- number two, we can support and uphold these things by just encouraging people, right? Just encouraging people. You know, so that friend who comes to you and says, hey, you know, I was baptized as a baby, and now, you, you know, your pastor trying to make me be baptized again. So encourage them. Say, hey, when you were baptized as a baby, were, were you professing your faith? Well, w- wouldn't you like to do that now, right? Wouldn't you like to tell the world of what the Lord has done for you in, in your salvation? Let me just encourage you. Let me just admonish you to, to you know, speak up what, what, about what God has done in your life in a way. So encourage people in that way. And number three, sometimes at the table, we will practice discipline. I'm not going to say much here because we're about to turn to that point, but uphold the discipline that happens at the table too, okay? So there's just three other things to do by way of application. 
And if you're interested, again, to think more about um, the sacraments, to think more about the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, again, you can check those sermons out online. Uh, read Matthew 26, uh, where Jesus institutes the supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, where Paul gives some clarifying instructions around the supper. Those would be two great places to, to kind of sit and think about what it means to take communion. Uh, if you want to think more about baptism, you can turn to a chapter like Romans chapter 6 uh, and think there about what Paul says about baptism or Matthew 28, which we have mentioned, uh, a number of other places as well. Amen? You with me? Questions, comments, concerns? You really can't ask one if you have one. Okay. Hmm. Great question. So why did Jesus say, this is my body broken for you, if um, the Bible says none of his bones were broken, right? Uh, I'd say there, there are other ways of, of having a body broken. So like the pierced side, the crown of thorns on his head, the breaking of skin, the breaking of flesh, the, the bleeding out um, that, that happens there uh, on the tree. That Those are other ways that his body is literally broken. But he's also using that phrase symbolically, right? That this is my body given for you. Um, and in that sense, broken for you in judgment, et cetera, uh, as well. That's yeah, a great question. Thank you. Anybody else? Amen. All right, number three then, okay? So we're going to uphold and support the ministry of the word of God by, number one, attending to the preaching of the word. Number two, the administration of the sacraments. And number three, the exercise of church discipline. You see there the references to Matthew chapter 18 and 1 Corinthians 5. And those, are, those are two passages that are sort of classical passages for talking about church discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, is a situation where there's a man in the church who has his father's wife, right? Uh, not, not his mom, we think, maybe his stepmom, right? And the church there. It's like, oh, you know, we're so we're so progressive, we're so accepting, and they're like, they're all right with that. And Paul writes them and says, listen, not even unbelievers do that. Not even pagans do that, right? You should be ashamed rather than proud. And Paul says there around verse 5 or 6, when you gather together and the Lord Jesus is present, put this man out of your fellowship. Hand him over to Satan is the phrase that Paul uses there so that he would learn not to sin and his soul would be saved on the day of Christ. Okay? Now, that's, that's church discipline in the case of um, what's called scandalous public sin. Right? This man was sinning publicly and openly, and it was scandalous, meaning not even unbelievers would do it. Well, Jesus gives similar instruction in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. Now, here now, Jesus says, um, if, if your brother has something against you. So he's not talking now about public scandalous sins. He's talking about sins that have committed between individuals, right? What's called private sins. He says, if your brother has something against you, go to him, show him his fault. Uh, and if he'll listen to you, you've won your brother, right? So that's the whole, that's, that's the beginning and the end of the process. Somebody says something, cross the Pastor T. Pastor T has a responsibility to go to that brother and say, you know what? That, that hurt and that was sinful. It wasn't true. Let's talk about this. Let's work this out. And, and if, if that person will listen and, and we can be reconciled, that's the end of the matter, right? But Jesus says, now, if he will not listen to you, take two or three others along with you so that everything will be established by two or three witnesses. And in that process, now, you're trying to, again, work on reconciliation and repentance and restoration. And if your brother listens to you, you've won it. That's the end of the matter. You don't need to go beyond those two or three because then it's another sin. You're gossiping, right? Now, Jesus says in verse 17, if he will not listen to them, tell it to the whole church, right? So you see what's happening there is, is sort of a series of escalations. And each escalation is triggered by the fact that the person is continuing in sin and refusing to repent of the sin and refusing to be restored in their walk with Christ, yet is remaining in the church wearing the name of Christ while walking in that sin. And now Paul, oh, excuse me, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, now when you tell it to the church, if he will not listen to the whole church, exhorting him to repent and to be restored, and Jesus says, you ought to treat him like a pagan and a tax collector, which is to say, you treat this person now like they're not believers, right? 
like now, like, yeah, they're not, they're living contrary to the gospel. Right? Now, the whole aim of this process is to help people who sometimes get into trouble in their spiritual walk to walk right, to straighten up, to follow Jesus in obedience to the scripture, to live the Christian life in the way that the Bible instructs, right? To do the kinds of things that we're talking about here in the, in the church covenant. The point is not punishment. Church discipline is never about punishment. If you go to a church and they practice discipline, and it's about punishment, which is one of the things that comes to mind when we hear the word discipline. If, if, it, if it's about punishment, you're in an abusive church. Those folks are misusing the scripture and misusing authority. The whole point here is actually to help someone escape the clutches of sin and return to walking with Jesus. And sometimes people get in situations where they need to be helped with that. And where things like conversation and appealing to them individually and privately don't work. And you work your way up to having to do it publicly uh, in this last step of removing them from membership. And even then, the hope is as you remove them from membership, you, you turn them out to the world in that sense, that in the buffeting and the beating that comes from the world and sin, they will go, oh, I'm not supposed to be out here. I'm supposed to be in the ark of safety. I'm supposed to be in the church right, where I'm protected by the grace of God. Now, church discipline has actually two aspects. I've given you the aspect that troubles most people. That's called corrective church discipline, but that's like 5% of the discipline that ever happens in a church. The other 95% of discipline that happens in a church comes from the teaching of the Word of God. It's called formative discipline. That by the teaching of the Word of God, the study of the Word of God, we are formed into the image and the likeness of Christ. Right? So right now, you guys are sitting under discipline. You're listening to me preach this sermon. Your thoughts and your hearts, hopefully, are being shaped by the truth of the Bible in this sermon. You are being disciplined or, to use a, root, a, a common root word, another, another word from the same root word, you are being discipled. A disciple is simply a Christian embracing the discipline of the Lord, the teaching, the instruction, the training, the shaping of the Lord. And if a church doesn't exercise discipline in either the formative or the corrective sense, in what sense is it a church? If you can call yourself a member of a church and live any kind of way contrary to the Bible, in what sense are we a church? And this is why the reformers said, hey, one of the marks of a true church is going to be the exercise of discipline formative and corrective, because we are all learning to follow Jesus. We're all learning to walk with Jesus, pastor to the people. And we need each other in this walk, to learn to walk together in this way. So as a church, we practice discipline. We, we want to do it lovingly. We want to do it gently. We want to do it biblically, right? So sometimes people get nervous and be like, okay, if, if we're going to practice discipline with sin, ain't going to be nobody left in the church. Well, if we're Pharisees, that's true. If we don't understand the gospel, that's true. If we don't understand sanctification, that's true. If we don't understand the difference between weakness and wickedness, that's true. But discipline is not something you administer to the weak. It's not something you administer just because we are frail and imperfect, it's something you administer when the person is rebellious, will not listen, will not listen, will not listen. Three times Jesus says that in Matthew 18, right? And listen to what? Not just what the pastor says, this is what the Bible says, right? So I, we need to, in the practice of discipline, be able to point to a text, have that person read it in context, ask them to interpret it to us, and have them understand what the Bible is teaching. Right? It's not because I think you're in sin that you get disciplined. It's because the Bible is clear about that thing. So the, so the clearer the sin is and the more egregious the sin is, the more likely we move toward discipline. Right? So you're not going to be disciplined because you're greedy. I mean, how would we know that somebody's greedy? Maybe they ate a little much that day. But maybe they hadn't eaten in three days. Right? Or pride. Pride is a sin that God hates. But it'd be difficult to discipline somebody for pride, wouldn't it? Because you can't, you can't quite put your finger on and say, that's pride. I know that for sure. Right? 
So if the sin is like that, it's not likely to lead to discipline. Not, not of the corrective sort where you're kicked out of the church. But there are other sins that are just manifestly clear. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 is talking about a man who's sleeping with his father's wife. Everybody know that sin, right? And he's proud about it. You, you can't sort of treat that like weakness. That ain't weakness. That's rebellion. That's wickedness, right? And so the clearer the sin is in the scripture and to observation, the more likely you are to enter into corrective discipline. Now, as a church, we need to uphold and support this because it upholds and supports the gospel, right? If we are unclear about how Christians ought to live, we're then unclear about what Jesus has saved us from, right? Christ came to save us from sin, perish the thought that we should give ourselves to sin. No way. That's just contrary to the gospel, right? Jesus came to rescue us from the destruction of, of hell and Satan. We should not be complying with Satan in how we live and, and choosing a path of life that, that leads to judgment, right? And so when we are clear about this as a church community and we support each other and form each other in discipline or correct each other in discipline, we clarify the gospel. What's the, one of the most popular criticisms you ever hear people who are not Christians make about the church? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Why does the charge of hypocrisy stick against the church? Is it not because churches have too often lived just like the world and then preached against the world? Isn't it? Well, what corrects for that? Well, the thing that Jesus gave us that corrects for that is the exercise of church discipline. So when folks start acting like hypocrites, like, oh, hey, 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 no, no. We follow Jesus. And the Bible says we're to judge insiders, not outsiders. So, so already, if, if churches are spending their time judging all the outsiders and letting this go on, we, we all off the mark. We done lost the plot. The Bible says judge yourselves first, right? And so if, if we see somebody walking contrary to the gospel and the scripture, right, we, we, we have responsibility to say, no, 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 beloved, let's walk right. Let's act right. And to call them back to righteousness. And, and if that doesn't work at some point, and usually it takes a long time to get to the point where you're removing somebody from membership, long time, usually meaning months and years, right? At some point, you may have to say, okay, we, we have to turn you out because you're not living like a Christian. Now, the covenant says we are meant to uphold and support the exercise of church discipline. As members, that's what we're committing to. And so I want to sort of talk just a little bit as we close about what that, what that looks like. I'm going to give you four things that that, that looks like. Um, and before I do that, I want, to, I want to give you an illustration. In, in my first pastorate, I had not been in that pastorate six months. And we had our first two situations that biblically would require discipline. Now, if you're a pastor, a new pastor in a church, you really don't want to be doing this in six months. You don't even really want to be doing this in six years. You, you, you want to get to that church because most churches haven't practiced this in centuries, maybe, if, if at all, right? And so you don't want to be rushing in there talking about, well, we're going to discipline people. People look at you like you're crazy. Man. Why are you in my business? All that good stuff, right? You, you got to take your time to teach, teach the gospel, teach church membership, teach sanctification, teach what it means to belong together, the kinds of things we're doing in this covenant. You, you want to spend several years doing that before you have to do something like this. So the Lord in his providence, though, he knows how to lead his church. He brings these two things to light. And I'm like, oh, snap, there's no way for us not to be hypocrites if we don't address this. Let me give you what one of those situations was. It was a former deacon whose wife had come to us and said, I need help because my husband is living an adulterous relationship. He was doing it openly, carrying on with other, uh, this other woman. They had two young children. He was showing up on Sunday, sitting in his regular spot like he was cool, and then going out Monday through Saturday, abandoning his wife, kicking it with this woman. And I turned to the fellows. I said, look, this guy is a guy of prominence, has been in our church. He's been a deacon. He is not blushing at all about his sin. He's refusing to meet with us and to talk with us. His wife is a member. Now we have responsibilities to her as well. She's come to us asking for help. We cannot sit on our hands here. 
and call ourselves faithful pastors. And so the Lord started forcing us through these issues, forcing us through these. Long story short, we end up um, removing this man from membership. We end up excommunicating him, um, supporting his wife, coming around the wife and the children. And I remember talking to one of the members of the church who was a good friend of this guy. They've been friends for years. And it came to me, we had a couple of conversations. I mean, I'm just really struggling with this. This is the first time the church has done that, right? So he was, he was struggling with this. I see it in the Bible. I think it's clear. But it just, it just doesn't feel right. It feels mean. And I was trying to tell him, it's, it's not mean, it's clear. It's not mean, it's clear, right? Uh, it just feels mean. And so he finally comes to me and he says, I talked with my dad, who was an elder at another church. So I talked with my dad. And what my dad told me was, um, this person just needs me to be his friend. I'm just be his friend. And so contrary to everything we instructed the church to do, he decided he was just going to keep kicking it with me. And my point was, brother, you are undermining the discipline of the church because you are communicating to him that his life is just fine the way it is and that all the rest of the Christians who have voted to do this are just mean Christians. Don't do that, beloved. That is not upholding the discipline. That is undermining the discipline. And I'll tell you, as I told him, and you're not being a very good friend. I mean, if you can see your friend walk out on their family, walk out on their spouse, walk out on their children, act like ain't nothing happened, and you can co-sign that, either by silence or you good or it happens, whatever, beloved, you're not being a friend. You're not being a Christian friend. You, You are dulling that person's conscience on the way to God's judgment. Don't do it. Don't do it. So we want to uphold the discipline of the church. Let me give you four quick ways. Number one, support the decision. If we come to a place where as a church we have to exercise church discipline, we always have a process where we explain what happened, what steps we've taken, and what the person's response has been. We try to give you enough information so that you are informed, but not so much information that it makes it hard for that person to come back in repentance. Right? So there's an art there for us as pastors of trying to tell you enough so that you know what's going on, but not so much because it ain't none of your business, right? So if you feel like you've got enough information and we've sort of clarified for you what the sin is and what our steps have been, and we've now come to a decision, even if you were sort of the minority opinion in that, once we vote as a family, we have to act as a family. So support the decision would be the first thing. Number two, uphold the discipline. So when you move somebody out of the membership in church discipline, part of what we're saying is we're not saying you're not a Christian. We can't say that. We don't know that. That's Jesus' job. But we are saying we can't affirm your testimony anymore because you're not living like a Christian. right? So we're not saying you're definitely not a Christian. We're just saying based upon the way you're living, we got to step back with saying you're good because it don't look like you're good. Like you, like you headed for the world and headed for judgment. And, and the reason we want to sort of step back that way is so that you might feel the coldness of being in the world apart from Christ and his church. And feeling that coldness come back to the warmth, right? But it only takes a few people to sort of go out and say, as that guy did in my previous church, he just needs a friend right now. And, and, and in the fellowship of that two or three people who are not upholding the discipline, that person gets sort of affirmed in their sin. Don't do that, beloved. It's not loving. It's not loving. Even if we have to keep having internal discussions about it, right? And and to encourage each other and to help each other, don't go to that person and make that person feel like they're right when they're in sin and unrepentant. Uphold the discipline of the church. Number three, pray for repentance. Pray for repentance, right? So this is not a time for the church to be in debate. Again, we want to shepherd you and answer questions, but what we mostly want to do is pray, right? So we have a care list as a church, and sometimes on that list are people that we know that might be headed toward discipline. I hope you're praying for them every day. Seriously, don't let that be in one ear, out the other. And then two months later, we come to a members meeting. You're like, what happened? Well, did you pray? Pray, seek the Lord, ask for mercy, ask for grace. Lord, turn their hearts. How beautiful it was in the life of this young church when we saw one young man whom we had to sort of remove and discipline come back to the church repentant. It was like two years later. But he came back to the church and said, you guys were right to discipline me. I was wrong. I accept this discipline. And here's what's happened in terms of God's grace and the change in my life now where I've come back to the Lord. And to say explicitly, 
that would not have happened if you guys didn't discipline. See, this is meant to be grace to a person. And that brother received it. And I started to think how many Christians are in sin who don't receive this grace because churches are not faithful and courageous enough to exercise this. So pray for repentance. And should they repent, celebrate. Celebrate. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4 or so. Paul says there, um, listen, the, the, the discipline, the punishment that was given by the majority, it's enough. That person has repented. Now affirm your love for them. Rejoice over them. Right? So we do this anticipating the day when we will rejoice to receive that brother or sister back free of sin and walking again with Christ. And in doing this, we're upholding a gospel ministry in this church. Amen? All right. Questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Is that Jada? Tell me your name. Oh, you bass on. I thought you were Jada for a moment. Go ahead. Star. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. So she's a Christian. She has roommates, alternative lifestyle. She wants to see them come to Christ and share the gospel with him. And she's wondering, is, is she supporting that alternative lifestyle by living with him? Right? So everything that I've been, it's a great question. Everything I've been talking about here applies to the church to folks who are professing to be Christians. We do not expect people who are not Christians to live like Christians. This is one of the problems with that capital E evangelicalism thing we were talking about earlier, right? It just, you know, everybody got to live like Christians. Like, but they aren't Christians. They're not born again. They don't have the mind of Christ, you know? And this is how we look like legalists, right? So, no, what your main agenda is, just like our main agenda in the case of church discipline is, is to share the gospel. Talk with them about Jesus live a life that's open to them so they can see what it looks like to follow Jesus. If they ask you about why you make a decision this way and there's a Jesus explanation, tell them, well, this is the difference the gospel and Jesus makes and, and this, is what I'm, this is what I'm hoping for and looking for. We need to keep our friendships with people who are not Christians. Alternative lifestyle or not, this is why we're in the world, is to hold out to them the hope of Jesus Christ, right? Now, we don't want to be drawn into the world and the things that they're doing. So we've got to be honest about that. And that's why we need Christian fellowship so that our main relationships are nurturing us in Jesus, right? But we need to keep those relationships. Those friendships are a blessing. You are a blessing to them, right? Love them, encourage them, live differently, and explain that in terms of Jesus and the gospel, and pray and trust that God might make that winsome so that they would come to believe themselves and repent in that way. Amen. Praise God for your faithfulness. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's a great question. How church discipline and sort of biological family discipline, how are they the same, how are they different? I think it's a, a very good analogy, right? So in our families of origin, um, we got parents, I like we had the same mom and daddy. You're going to live in my house, you're going to live by my rules, right? Um, and if you don't live by those rules, you got to go, right? Um, I've seen some of my siblings have to go, <laughs> have to go. Um, but that was an act of love, right? And it didn't change the fact that we were family biologically, right? It meant that in a very real sense, we could not live together as family and act together as family um, because some other things needed to be maintained, like respect for the home or, or you know, whatever the situation may have been. Um, church discipline is a lot like that, right? So when we say we, we are not affirming the testimony, it's a little, by, little bit like saying, you still might be my brother, right? But you out there right now. We got, we got to sort of turn you out until you learn to live by God's household rules, so to speak, right? So I think that's a very good analogy. 
The difference is this, and, and it's not a difference I'd make too much of, but it, it is a difference. In our biological family, we, we, are, we are sort of sewn together by, by blood, right, by kinship. That's just never going to change, right? No matter how estranged that relationship gets, we still claim that person as family, right? Not quite the same way as a church, right? So that person can go deeper and deeper into sin, and it becomes harder and harder. So, so the parallel to claiming them as family is affirming them as a Christian. It gets harder and harder to affirm them as a Christian, right? It's like, actually, it's 10 years now, and you show no evidence of conviction. And we know from, from Hebrews that if, if we sin and we really are God's children, he chastises us. He convicts us, right? Um, and you show no conviction. The Bible says that, that probably means you're illegitimate children, right? Uh, and, which is another sort of language of saying you're not really family. So that, that would be where that would differ a bit. Yeah. It's, a great, it's a great analogy because I think maybe all of us have had experience in our natural families of, of maybe someone not living right to the point where you, 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 you bear with them, you bear with them, you bear with them, you bear with them, you go, you know what? You got to go. You got to go. You're hurting more things than you're helping. Okay. Anybody else? Question? Maybe one more? Yeah, Mike. Praise God. Mike is saying, he's thanking us for um, being a faithful church uh, in that case of church discipline with, with our brother Ethan, um, saying that that was their first members meeting, actually. That's a, that's a doozy of a first members meeting. Walk in on, on discipline. But you walked in on a, on a great part because it was the part where the brother was coming back saying, um, you know, wanting to be restored uh, and confessing his sin. And, and that made an impression uh, on him as well. So we praise God for that. Anybody else? All right. Well, let me offer a word of prayer. You guys have been patient. I should, I should conclude some kind of way. So in conclusion, <laughs> this is a part of our covenant. This is a part that we commit to, um, to defend and maintain a gospel ministry in this church. And we do that by supporting and upholding the preaching of the word of God the administration of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, uh, and the exercise of church discipline. And all those things are, are like a nice um, setting, a ring setting to hold the diamond of the gospel, right? Uh, you, take a, you break up the setting, you break up the band, the diamond falls out, you lose the diamond. This is our way of keeping the bands strong and clean so the diamond is brilliant, the gospel is brilliant. Jesus is seen to be who he really is. And that's what we're committing to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, indeed, we pray that you would help us to keep our commitment here to be faithful, O oh Lord, um, in preaching, in the sacraments, in training and instruction of discipline, formative, and from time to time, corrective. We, we pray that, Lord, for as long as you leave this church in the world, you would keep us faithful. You, you would make the gospel clear. And God, we pray that you would save people from the judgment to come and bring them into your love and eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we have a long way to go as a church. We're no perfect church. We, we maybe understand some of these things better than we practice them. And so give us grace. Give us mercy. And help us to grow together. Uh, help us, Lord, not to be afraid of, of questions and not to be afraid of disagreement. Um, but to bring our minds beneath the rule of the Bible, the rule of Scripture, uh, and to there find unity and purpose and direction in all things. Lord, we praise you for making us a church, and we praise you for all of your churches, Lord, represented by some of our visitors here. We pray that you would bless their churches back home in all of these ways and others. And uh, we pray that you would bless the churches across this city and our neighborhood, who are meeting and preaching your name. And we ask for your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.
Praise God. Well, beloved, we have the privilege this morning of ending our service with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The very thing that we've been talking about here in terms of the administration of the sacraments. I won't say much more to set it up because I said a lot of, about it in the, in the sermon. But this is a meal that we eat at the Lord's table. The table spread for us to remember his sacrifice for us and to proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes. And like all meals, it's nourishment. Now, this is not nourishment for our bodies. This is nourishment for our souls. This is nourishment for our spirit. This is where we come again to drink in and to feed upon God's grace in Jesus Christ. And so I want to invite my fellow elders to, to come up uh, and join me here this morning, Pastor Tim and Pastor Tunde. And at the supper, we're meant to remember all the members of the church. So remember Pastor Dennis of celebrating his birthday this weekend. Yeah, amen. Thank you, brother. Okay. So, all right. And so as we have uh, typically done, we want to read a portion of Scripture, and uh, we want to renew our covenant. We want to ask the Lord's blessings upon the elements. So let me first make sure that everyone who wishes to be served has been served. Does everybody have the communion elements? If you don't, just raise your hand. Okay. And then we've got a couple of the ushers there coming up the aisle to, to bring you some. And there are gluten-free options as well. So if you need a gluten-free option, our sister uh, Kwanzaa has as well. Anybody need gluten-free? Sister Kwanzaa over here and up front. Excellent. Levon, a couple of these as well. There you go. You guys have elements? Excellent. So I want to invite uh, Pastor Tunde to come and to read for us the instructions on the supper from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, and then we're going to renew our covenant together. Are you doing that as well? Um, and then after that, Pastor Tim is going to lead us in a prayer of confession, and we'll take the supper together. Thank you. Microphone's behind you. Good morning, ARC. So now I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to, to the end of it. Um, okay. This is the word of God. Now, Excuse me, <laughs> the thing moved, shifted. Okay, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for, for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give you directions when I come. Now, let us renew our covenant. It's on page nine of the bulletin. Thank you for rising on your feet. It shows how seriously we take this. Our church covenant. Having been brought by God's grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we now, in dependence upon his spirit, resolve to live by faith and so establish this covenant with each other. By God's grace, we will submit to the authority of the scriptures as a final word of all matters of life and doctrine. We will not work pray for the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We will be devoted to one another in brotherly love, with humility and gentleness. We will patiently bear with each other, forgiving, encouraging, and building one another up, exercising watchfulness over each other, and admonishing one another when necessary. We will not neglect to gather together or pray for ourselves and others. We promise to bring up our children and youth in the training and instruction of the Lord and by a pure and loving example to seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, helping to carry each other's burdens. We will seek by God's help to live carefully in this world deny ungodliness and worldly passions. We will strive to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age as we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, Savior Jesus Christ. We will defend and maintain the evangelical ministry in this church by supporting and upholding the preaching of the Word of God the administration of the gospel sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the exercise of church discipline. We will contribute cheerfully, generously, and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We will, when we move from this place, as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. With the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. You may be seated. Join me now as I offer a word of prayer as we confess our sins to the Lord. Father, truly we have been instructed by your word this morning, through the preached word. Father, we have been reminded of the good news of Christ, this evangelical ministry that we will support and uphold. We've been reminded of the beauty and the, and the truthfulness of the gospel. Father, we've been reminded that it is Christ who has come to earth, who has lived a perfect life. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And this morning, we are grateful for that. Father, we have been reminded, we have been instructed from your word how Christ, though he was sinless, 
died on the cross for our sins, for the sins that we have committed, the sins that we will unfortunately commit tomorrow and the day after. They were nailed to the cross, Colossians says on the cross of Christ. And then we were reminded that three days later, he got up from the grave for indeed he was sinless and death had no power over him. Fathers, we are reminded of the holiness of Christ as we ended the sermon and thought about discipline and, and sinfulness in our lives. We are, reminded this, we are reminded rather that sometimes we are not holy. Sometimes we do sin. Father, we come this morning, as we had just heard from uh, 1 Corinthians, we come discerning ourselves. Father, we come admitting and confessing that, yes, we are Christians. Yes, we have repented and believed. But, Father, at times we sin. And, Father, we come humbly to you, to the throne of grace, knowing that we can find forgiveness because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And so this morning, Father God, before we take the cup, before we take the bread, which, as we were reminded by our sister Vanessa earlier, represents Christ's body broken for us. Before we take these elements, Father, we come first and foremost confessing our sins to you, confessing that we have not done right from the last time we took the supper until now, whether it be in word, thought, or deed. Father, we come confessing and we beg your forgiveness and we take great comfort and assurance knowing that forgiveness is ours, if indeed we are in Christ this morning. And so, Father God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for loving us in Christ. And we thank you for loving us even through our sin. But, Father, as a sign of our love for you, we ask that we will keep the covenant as we try our best through God's Holy Spirit to live lives of godliness. And, Father, may we never be hypocrites, as we heard earlier. May we never be okay with this sin in our lives. But when sin is found in our lives, may we quickly turn from that and turn back to you. It's in your son's name I do pray. Amen. It's our custom here to take this supper together um, because part of what this symbolizes is our unity. Uh, we wish to symbolize a unity both here as one local church but we also wish to symbolize our unity with other Christians from other churches. And so if you're here this morning and you're a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're able to take uh, the supper at your church and your church preaches the same gospel that you heard here, we welcome you here as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we, we rejoice to be able to celebrate what we have in common in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we welcome you to this table. Now, if you're here this morning and for some reason your pastors have instructed you not to take the supper, because in some way you are not walking in uh, a manner worthy of the gospel and taking this supper, as we heard read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, unworthily could lead to God's judgment, then we ask you not to take the supper here. We want to uphold the discipline of your local church, and we want to exhort you to remember how you have been counseled by your pastors from the Word of God uh, in order that you might follow Christ faithfully. Now, if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, we're so glad you're here. We, we welcome you here. We're thankful that you are here. We're thankful you give us two hours on a Sunday morning when you could have been asleep. Uh, but yet you came, whether because it was Mother's Day or whatever it was, you came. And we trust that you have heard the gospel this morning, that you've heard this good news, that though we are sinners, God has done everything that needs to be done to save us from his judgment by sending his son to the cross for our sins and raising him from the grave for our eternal life. We want to encourage you to use this time not to take this meal, but to put your faith in Jesus. Think about what it symbolizes. If this meal passes you by, and this is the body and the blood of Jesus shed for your sins, for your salvation, for your rescue from hell, think about what it means for that to pass you by, for you to miss out on that. We, we would not have you miss out. We, we would have you come get some of what Jesus has purchased for you. So take this time to confess your sin, put your faith in Jesus, and the next time that we gather or you gather with another church, you will be gladly able to look back to this day when you were saved and to take this supper in a worthy way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for the elements. Father, we do pray that you would bless this meal to our bodies, this wafer which symbolizes the broken body of Christ, we pray that you would use it to nourish us as we with faith 
feed upon Christ. And as we drink this cup, O oh Lord, symbolizing uh, his blood shed for us, Lord, we pray that we would have some experience of once again being cleansed by the shedding of his blood. and Once again, feeling the forgiveness that we have through Jesus. Indeed, I, we pray that you would, you would communicate that to, to us this morning. Communicate the, the freedom and the joy and the lightness that comes from knowing that all our sins are forgiven and nailed to the cross. Lord, we pray, feed us this morning as we celebrate. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord sat with his disciples eating the Passover meal. And as we said before, redefined that meal in terms of his own sacrifice for our sins. He, gave, he broke the bread and he blessed it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. And so we do now. Let's eat together. On that same night, he took the cup and he blessed the cup. And he said that this cup was uh, symbolic of his blood, which would be poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And when he had blessed the cup, he said to the disciples, take and drink. And so 2,000 years later, we do as they did. We take, we drink. And the Bible says that we should do this as often as we would, anticipating the day that he comes. So we do this not only remembering, but anticipating. Remembering his sacrifice, remembering our salvation, and anticipating the day when we will eat with him in his kingdom. And the Bible says they went from that first Lord's Supper out into the Mount of Olives singing hymns. And so we do now. We're going to conclude our service with a couple of songs. And so turn it over to the praise team. Amen. Um, before we sing, we're actually going to sing only one more song. Um, and I want to share something that I wrote. Um, I actually wrote it for, um, the week of our anniversary Sunday that I was going to share at um, an event that we were going to do. Um, but I'm going to share it with you all today. And then we're just going to sing about the reckless love of God because he is so kind. He's so generous. Um, yeah. So I'll share. Um, this poem that I wrote, and then we will sing Reckless Love. To every ear, under the sound of this voice, I have an announcement to make. This voice is a miracle. Now, if I were to say that the sound of my voice, the fact that I am still speaking, is a miracle. My friends and family would laugh because they would tell you me and silence, me and quiet are not so synonymous because I am the friend, the sister who is loud and lovingly opinionated. They would say she has a voice that seems to have wings, a voice that likes to carry itself and share itself with whatever ear canal it chooses to nest in. But there are things many have never heard, nor have I dared to speak. Like there have been times where I have been tempted to steal my own breath, or there have been times that shame and pride pinned down my lips, rendering me mute. I remember the first time like it was still yesterday. Air slightly chill in the dust of broken dreams and arguments left an odor in the stairwell. I was old enough to know that one plus one equals two and that life wasn't fair, but not understand why. I knew that sticks and stones broke bones and that words could be just as deadly. I was old enough to know that mom didn't have two jobs for fun, but because she had two mouths to feed, even if it killed her. Be a good daughter, leave her, make her life easier. The sound that I recognize now, a slippery serpent slithered his words into my innocent ears. It led me to the top floor window. Just jump and you can be in heaven. Heaven, I look down at the cement below, then at the sky above, blue and wide, not a cloud for the sun to hide behind. I ran outside and I saw the sun and he touched my face. With age and time came valleys and mountain tops, but at times it seemed to me that valleys felt more like caverns. I have heard the slithering voice speaking in the darkness of the cavern of abuse, rejection, disappointment, manipulation, anger, and any and other depths I have the courage yet to utter. 
attempting to darken my eyes to blindness and bombard my eardrums with ruthless words about who I am or more so who I could never be. So what was the purpose of trying or even being? The last time I heard the coercive voice ringing loudly, by now ears and bodily mostly lost of innocence, heartbroken under the weight of grief and broken promises, standing by deep waters, numb. The only thing I felt was the tears burning down my face and all I could taste was the salt in my tears. Weeping did endure through the night and I'm still learning that joy comes in the morning, that joy comes during the morning, that joy comes through the morning not just of the things lost, but of the mistakes made. I will not stand before you and say that I have not played a role in some of my own tragedies. The years have made me well acquainted with the frailty of this human frame. As I journey on the road of life, I am continually learning the difference between covering my own nakedness and hiding in shame versus being covered in the blood of Jesus where shame is removed, dignity is restored, and my sin is erased under the power of his love and grace. And if you've lived any of the lives that I have, I promise you, I promise you there is no one like him. Because who can comfort the brokenhearted? Jesus. Who can heal all diseases? Jesus. When mother or father leaves or forsake you, who remains? Jesus. Who feeds me when I'm hungry? Jesus. Who quenches my thirst? Jesus. Who is closer than a friend? Jesus. Who covers our shame? Jesus. Who was wounded for our transgressions? Jesus. Who was bruised for our iniquities? Jesus. Who made a way for our salvation? Jesus, when I gomered myself, I adorned myself to meet other lovers and found them to be unfaithful, untrue. The only person who remained was Jesus. When the darkness of sorrow wrapped around me, the light that came to me was Jesus. And even now, between my pain and my pride, who still draws me nigh, draws me close, Jesus. These last two years have taught us anything. It taught us that this life is far too short and unpredictable. This existence as we know it is fleeting like the wind, but we were meant to know God. We were meant to glorify God. We were meant to know joy through and with God. He made a way through himself, Jesus. Don't let pain or pride be the reason you toss aside the gift of life abundant. If you've never known God, wants to be near. May this be an invitation. If you've forgotten, may this be a reminder. If you're here under the sound of my voice, I have an announcement to make. The fact that you and I are still here is a miracle. I want you all to stand with me as we sing the song Reckless Love. And let us be reminded of all the things that he did. It's Jesus. At the end of the day, it's always been and always will be Jesus. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so good to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Sing it if you know it. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh. 
when I was your foe. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Sing oh. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, it leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall, no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. One more time, there's no wall, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And know oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, till you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Just to praise God all by herself. Give God praise and glory. I mean, hold on to those words. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. I mean, you know, God is pursuing some of y'all. He's pursuing us all. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. That's the one I like. So we can be so susceptible to believing things that aren't true. God will kick down, tear down every one of those lies that exalt itself against the knowledge of God coming after us. It's a relentless God, relentless love. May we stop running and turn to him. Amen? Well, beloved, just a couple things as we prepare to depart. A couple more graduates came in. Brother Faraji. Amen. Come on. Come on.
And did the other Jalen come in as well? What's what's good, man? What's good, man? Yeah. <laughs> like, but like, where yeah, he that he incognito today, man. Incognito. And so these brothers also, God's been so gracious to sustain them their four years or so in college and to bring them to graduation. Uh, my man Jalen, any, any sports fans in here? Yeah, amen. Some sports fans here, five of us. Jalen, Jalen's going to be our source of information. He's moving to Atlanta and joining the staff of Bleacher Report. Uh, and so we give God praise for that. Amen. Amen. My man Faraji is graduating. Faraji is heading to med school. Yeah, is that right? Headed to medical school. I don't know that um, I either know where or want to say where. Oh, oh, we love you anyway. Take the gospel to, to Carolina, man. <laughs> Praise be to God. UNC Chapel Hill. And so um, these brothers, as you know, have been just a real blessing to us. Uh, I just love the way uh, our college students plug into our family here. Uh, when it would be easy for them to say, you know what, I'm on campus up here in Northwest, y'all down in Southeast. They make that trek on Sunday mornings. And more than that, uh, just plug into the life of the church. I've, I've received calls from Jalen just say, hey, I just want to check in. How you doing? I know many of you all have as well. I, I think this brother been mowing people's yards and all kind of things, man, just serving the church family. And Faraji's, uh, they've been leaders on campus and uh, leaders here in our community, uh, church community. We just praise God for uh, our college students. And uh, we, we just we just delight delighted to see his grace in your life and encourage you and your families in that way. And again, again, if you if you guys are visiting with us, celebrating with with folk, we're so glad to have you here. There's a hospitality table uh, after uh, the service, just on the other side of the wall. There, uh, some nice cookies and muffins and uh, bottled water, uh, things of that sort. Uh, grab a cookie. Don't let the kids eat them all. Uh, let's let's us get one or two as well, and uh, you know, meet, stick around, and let's meet each other and greet each other uh, and fellowship in that way. Amen. All right. Hear now the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for a moment of silence. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, Church. Mother's Day.